Brothers. <laughs> okay. Tommy Craig. Do. Do I, I can remember? I have. I can call the meeting to order. I can committee can call the meeting to order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have not received any other business items in advance of this meeting. Okay. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. Item one is the minutes of the council and committee meeting held on Monday, June nineteenth. Recommendation to approve. Moved <coughs> by uh, Councillor Marston. Second by Councillor Asmundson. All in favor? Okay. Yes. Item two is a delegation. However, Mr. Chair, I do not believe the delegation is currently here. Um, I'd suggest we'd move on to the next item and see where we land. But oh, oh, later. To okay. That. Me too. Item three is the e plan yeah. demonstration. We have introductory comments by the general manager planning and development and a presentation by the manager building <coughs> and approvals and application services manager. They may have felt the, the parking was easier to find than it is. It's crazy down there right now. Afternoon, Mr. Chair. Afternoon, Mr. McIntyre. Full team today, so you're good. Okay. Excellent. Sure. Yeah, please. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Chair, committee members. Uh, before I introduce the team, I just got some um, some very brief uh, intro comments, and. Um, I want to say that we're very pleased to be here today uh, to provide this update on the uh, city's e-plan um, system. That's uh, electronic plans management system. And um, <clears throat> what is e-plan? I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to team members. I'll go through a presentation and give you a better uh, understanding of that. But uh, I guess uh, in a phrase, it would be um, um, basically it's the way the world's going. It's uh, electronic and moving away from hard copy, paper-based uh, applications. And, and submissions on that. Um, in doing that, it, it offers uh, efficiencies, uh, time savings, and actually um, some lower production costs for applicants as well. I just uh, learned that. <clears throat> the um, committee might want to note that the uh, E Plan project it's a priority C under the city's business plan. It's um, under the Achieve Excellence in City Governance goal. Um, <clears throat> And I would note, and though some councillors will concur, we've been at this for a while, um, but there's been steady progress. And um, in the end, we found that's necessary. Um, it actually it's proven to be a little more complicated task, I think, than we originally uh, anticipated. But also, too, um, we felt that um, getting it right was more important than getting it fast, because in, in Hayes, there is uh, the potential to fail, which others have done with this uh, sort of initiative. So. Um, but before I introduce the, the team and uh, hand it off, uh, I'd just like to recognize and compliment our uh, ICT department, uh, James and Danny, been, uh, um, along with the staff and planning and development have uh, got plugged into this, have been instrumental in this project going forward, and uh, a lot of effort has been put into this initiative, and um, I think we'll soon be rewarded with a, a soft launch of one, on one uh, aspect of it. So. Um, I'll introduce the, the panel that's up here with me. There's Jim Bon Temple. Most of the committee knows Jim. He's one of our building permits managers, and he's one of the key leads from uh, planning and development on the project. Uh, next to Jim is uh, James Anshu from ICT, and we've uh, been pushing James, and he's responded very, very well to uh, helping us through the process on that, and he'll uh, do part of the presentation as well. And then um, a special mention, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Daryl Bridge. Daryl is one of our uh, plans examiners, one of our senior uh, um, building technologists, and he's going to do a little uh, show and tell demo on the, the blue Ooh. tools. So that's our group. And if we can just take a few more minutes of your time. Sure. Or you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, this is a little okay, buddy. technology. <laughs> what are we doing here? I don't have any idea. I don't want technology. Thank you, James is here. <laughs> um, we kind of have a non gym today. <laughs> <laughs> IT expert every desk. <laughs> yeah. uh, good to see everybody. Um, we thought it'd be time to uh, give you an update. What have we been up to the last two, three years? I know some of you probably think this has been going on for a lot longer than that since the idea was born. Um, we are w working through this very carefully. We 
<clears throat> we run into obstacles, but we solve them. And the key is that I think at the end of the presentation, you'll see that, uh, yeah, there's things that need to be worked on, but there's a lot of things that are working well, and we're, we're, we're working with them now. So a um, little bit of an update. Recall that <clears throat> we have three key pieces of software running right now. <clears throat> Amanda is a system that came in in 1996, and that's the core of our permit tracking system. We, you, we're a heavy user of that software. It's been upgraded a couple of times over the last two, three years. We still have a couple upgrades. It runs our inspections, our mobile inspections, our inspections booking, our plan tracking from A to Z from the beginning that an ap applicant inquires. We track information right to the end. <clears throat> Uh, it's a system that's the core of, of how planning and development operates and how it refers to all other departments that also get involved in development review. So fire department, parks, engineering, development servicing. It's our communication piece. The second one up there is Bluebeam. You'll see Bluebeam at the bottom there. That's the markup tool. And I think initially that's where we talked about um, getting excited about let's get something that helps us do plan checks that's the piece that helps us do plan checks it marks up the plans it allows us to communicate deficiencies and ideas with other people and the applicant but it's not the communication piece that controls all the information flow and the referral system okay and we're going to demo that and we're going to show you how that piece works the third part is Bentley. That's the piece that we're currently putting through testing now, debugging, working. James is, is working on that. Bentley is the piece that controls commentary from who to whom, back and forth. It's the public portal piece. It's the piece that will allow the applications to come in electronically. It's the piece that will help track the communication that's going on during the planning review process. And it's the piece that at the end of the day, we send back to the applicant, these are your list of deficiencies noted on such and such. The other piece, it's the chess clock. It's the piece that we're waiting for. It's the piece that says, <coughs> you've had it for X days, you had it for Y days. Is it a problem internally where things are hung up, or is it a problem with the with the uh, private sector side? Is it a, is it hung up with a consultant? We can show at the end of the day what transpired through a permit process. <clears throat> now Amanda does that, but it's very difficult. And when we get asked on how long what what happened, it's a bit of interpretation through it, and we do it, but it takes probably if several hours to do. Well, hopefully with a dashboard on Bentley, we'll be able to say, this is what transpired on this project. What have we done since 2014? <clears throat> we worked with UDI. Um, the vendor selection took a little bit longer, but that became more complex. We took five vending packages. We analyzed them. We had a committee review and we got them down to two. We ultimately uh, uh, decided on Bluebeam and Bentley because the two companies actually work together on a package. And at the end of the day, the committee felt that that was what we really wanted. There were benefits from that. Uh, that, that um, we implemented the Bluebeam markup tool in 2015. So although we're not live, we are using the software. And as we're going to show you later, it's actually been more successful beyond our wildest dreams. When we purchased it, <clears throat> we thought it'd be a markup tool only. And in fact, it's turned out to be a great piece of software that we're using now. In fact, we've issued 80 licenses through all the different staff currently. <clears throat> and I'll talk more about that later. Um, the Bentley design workshops, we met with Bentley at the high level saying, this is how we operate. You're gonna have to customize your software to work with us. And that was in 2015. 2016, we actually started meeting with Bentley as a team of, uh, of representatives of all the different departments. And we started working with Bentley saying, no, that doesn't happen this way, it happens that way. Single family permit comes in and who looks at that? Does, uh, you know, the engineering department, what do they do? Who, clerks, do they need drawings? Yes, no, so a lot of questions. <clears throat> Blue Beam workshop training started uh, um, uh, the end of last year, this year. We've done five workshops, James? Six. Four, six workshops with 
probably about 15 to 20 um, um, employees in each one. Uh, the Bentley system testing, and that's going on today, and that's where we are today. <clears throat> so the phases are that current, currently we're focusing on single-family building permits, although we're reviewing the software for all our permit streams, currently single-family building permits, our goal is that this fall we're going to start doing a pilot with, with uh, a couple of the companies out there that we feel... Um, can uh, uh, work well with us and, and through the portal. We're going to take it from top to bottom and see how the system works. <clears throat> the next phase is subdivision applications, and we hope to start work on that um, probably at the um, after the fall. If it all depends on how single family works out. If it works out well, subdivision will be right after that. Two family building permits and other complex buildings in 2018. So we're really, really hoping that if the software is performing the way we want it, that we're up and running in full, uh, all permit streams in 2018. So as I mentioned, Bluebeam, that's the markup tool. Um, we originally thought it'd be this tool that we could bubble and highlight and send it back saying, <clears throat> These are your deficiencies and problems. We do that by hand now. We mark up them by hand. And then we photocopy it at the end for a site copy. What have we found it can do for us? Well, it does linear and area calculations, which our staff are, are using every day. And later, Daryl's going to demonstrate what it does. We use it in elevation and grading analysis. That was something we never expected it to do, but it turns out uh, Bluebeam is a lot more powerful than we thought. <clears throat> Pictures a thousand words. I've talked about markups. Uh, the significant reduction in paper. Remember, right now, when an applicant for a major complex project comes in, they come in sometimes with carts and about seven sets of drawings, each set, three or four sets. They come in, all that has to be stamped and processed. It's distributed to all the relevant departments. Comments are made, it comes back, file manager <clears throat> pulls it all together. After several weeks, months of review, that set is copied and that one set then goes out to the site construction trailer and becomes a permanent fixture so that when inspectors and others <coughs> visit that site, there's an official set on site. Recently, for very large projects, we've been shipping it out for copying. And the cost is $3,000 for a complete set of drawings, but cheaper than having an employee copy it. We've been man managing to get the applicant to pay for that because it's worth their time. It takes two, three weeks to duplicate the set. Well, of course, when it's digital, all of that goes away. There'll be an electronic application. Everything will be processed electronically. And at the end of the day, we give them a, a, a flash card back or it's on the, on the net saying, congratulations, your permit's been issued, go make as many copies as you want. And there'll be color, the, the file will be locked down so that revisions cannot change to that electronic copy at the end of the day. Saves paper. Um, and the other beauty is the inspectors. Right now, the inspector goes to the construction trailer, pulls out the drawings and carries them 24 floors up the building with them if he needs them. When it's electronic, it'll be on their mobile tablet. Okay. So right now we're gonna give you a quick Bluebeam demo by Daryl who is our power user. He has pushed the software to the limits because he loves this kind of stuff and uh, he's also working on the committee finding all the bugs. So I'm gonna hand it over to Daryl. Okay, so as, as Jim said, it's it's been uh, more than, or it's done more than we've uh, expected it to. Um, here is here's an example of uh, something that I'm that I'm working on currently, and uh, it's just for an example, um, you guys all know about building size, the perimeter wall height, perimeter wall area, very complex portion of the zoning bylaw, very difficult to grasp and even more difficult to explain in words. Um, so with, with, uh, with, with Bluebeam, 
this was a very difficult um, building to to analyze for a building size, and the designer was having having some issues with it as well. And with the blue beam, we were you know or I was able to um, quickly uh, graphically demonstrate um, how and where, in this case, perimeter wall height is applied to each building face, and. Uh, as you can see, see here, the, the, the portions that are highlighted in, uh, in purple demonstrate that. Um, it's, it's done to all, all, all four sides. Um, and as you can see, I, you know, I do have some markups on here. Um, they're all, they're all re relevant information that I need to do uh, or, or that I need to do the review. And, uh, you know, one thing about marking up, um, uh, you know, like upon doing this, I, I noticed some uh, conflicting information on there, and uh, I was actually able to uh, call the designer on the phone, and um, let's see if I, can... I was able to verify wall heights that really make a make a difference to how perimeter wall height in this case is is is, is performed. And I was able to actually make these notes. They're just quick little notes, but I was able to do it while I was talking to him on the phone. And then I was able to uh, carry on with the review. I'll just, I'll just come back here. And it really, it's you know, kind of a time saver. I don't have to jot it down on a piece of paper and then transfer that paper over to the drawings and start dealing with them on there. And um, so, so as you can see, I was, I can, I can base everything off of off of a single line that I can apply to all four faces, and. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So so I was so I was able to carry on with the with with the uh, review. Um, so. It's seven meters. Yeah, that's just a geodetic elevation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, Daryl, that's hard to take it through. <laughs> yeah. New, a new box box box. Box. Things. So. So uh, eventually, this this part will be able to be done digitally. But even even now, I can scan the topographical survey, which is uh, just information about spot elevations on the on the lot, which is uh, a lot what perimeter wall height and area are are based upon. So I can I can scan this drawing. I can and, and I've scaled it to a known dimension. Uh, the, the the length of this. Um, property line, for instance, here. And I can actually plot the building to scale on, on the lot and compare it to spot elevations so I can determine what, you know, like where these elevations are. If, if, and uh, for instance, if there's not one around there, I already have this document scaled. But if I need to um, say I want to measure from that, that point to that point, those are two known elevations. Once I have that distance, I can interpolate the slope of that line, and and using the same measuring tool, I can measure to that point and use that slope to determine what that elevation is going to be at that corner of the building, based on the topographical survey, which really helps in determining uh, these these uh, grades. So that when I once I do all that, um, you can see you can see the lines in green here, and and here. So what I've what I've done is I've used this used this elevation of 107.14, which is the point at which perimeter wall height is measured to, and I can measure down from there, so I can really verify that their grades are in are in the correct location, and I can accurately or I can better accurately determine perimeter wall height. And if if you look in in this example here, this this dotted line is is the is the uh, designer's interpolation of, of, ex, of existing grade. Um, as you can see, my green line is, is close, and it's, it's, it's actually a little bit higher. Um, so that, that actually only helps them. But I can, I, can, I, can, I can visually verify the grades, and, and Bluebeam helps me, help, helps me to do that. Um, and, and so I was able to, to uh, verify that perimeter wall height did actually work with this. There's there's a couple of aspects to it, and this house was challenging because it pushed 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 those pushed those um, 
requirements to the limit here. So uh, it was it was really handy to be able to these like these these grades here in white. I'll just zoom in a little bit. Are actually taken from from these marks that I have, and I can scale them. I can actually do a do a dimension of it, so I can talk, so I can verify that you know these 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 heights meet. The requirements, and that, uh, it, it, and it also helped me to really show the designer, this is how it needs to be done, and uh, so. And I think that's 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 uh, that's it. Yeah, great. That takes us into the the other piece of software, Bentley. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, some of the key features, um, you know, we see a day where that applicant's going to go onto the web. He's going to put his uh, application into the portal. And on there will be checklists. And if that checklist isn't filled out correctly, well, it's like filling out a credit card application online. You just don't get past the first gate these days with anything if the information isn't correct. If they file incorrect information or what will happen is it will come in and it will be in a queue waiting for pre-screening and one of our staff are going to be pulling down applications off that queue and they're going to give it a quick check. And if the application checklist isn't correct or isn't there, it gets punted back. So the key is that the applications that are complete and accurate will come through the portal and into our electronic queue. Okay. Um, the other piece is the staff notifications, interdepartmental referrals. So, you know, Daryl might have a note on a file, and it's uh, it's to the parks department. Need this checked for vegetation, whatever, and uh, that dialogue happens. And in a in a queue that's recorded systematically through Bentley, um, it's also communication with the applicant. And the applicant has electronic access to the approved drawings, so when they're approved, they're back. So those are the key. Now, <clears throat> James is going to take you through a Bentley demo. Good afternoon. So what I'm going to show you is the application process, the, um, the re what we're calling the revise and resubmit, so what happens when uh, the drawings actually get sent back to the applicant and, and um, it's asked that they revise them and resubmit them. And then what the approved application is going to look like. So uh, let me just switch over to my, oh, my gosh, this one. I have to log in one more time. We're being teased by the tiny houses there. <laughs> So um, this is a very early sneak peek of what the, uh, the portal is going to look like from the applicant's perspective. So I'm going to focus on the applicant's experience. Um, Daryl's showing you what um, some of the tools the staff are going to use. So um, this is the first screen that they're going to get. Uh, we're still working on um, branding for the application, but uh, a special thanks to Corporate Communications for, for um, their help in, in developing the early uh, logos and colors for the application. So when an applicant comes in here, they have the ability to register, and they can register online and enter in their email address and everything. Just for sake of time, I'm going to actually log in with an existing account. And this is all currently in our test system, so we've got to love live demos. And once they log in, they have the ability to access their applications, enter in a new application, they have access to their profile, so if they have to change their password or change their information, they log out. In this case, I'm going to enter in a, um, a new application. And we've got it set up so it's connected to our property system so that they can go in and they can just start entering the, the host numbers and it's going to bring in the, the valid values for that so that we know, we know we're getting um, good properties. Mm. Um, and then they just enter in uh, a quick family home uh, description of what they're doing. We're uh, trying to automate it so that um, a lot of times the owners, the applicants, we uh, enter in that information. They can go through and there's a bunch of um, um, other information that they don't necessarily have to enter, but they can enter depending on the complexity of their application. 
we go down, there's some uh, drop downs. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to demolish my existing building. I'm going to go through and select. And these are all selections that are going to assist the plan reviewer uh, in reviewing the plan. So this is going to then go to the next stage where I'm going to actually upload my drawings. So in this case, I'm going to browse and I'm going to select a PDF and I'm going to upload it. I have the ability to upload multiple drawings, and we're gonna. One of the exercises that we're going through as a project team is determining how best it will be for staff for those drawings to be uploaded. Whether it's all going to be in one package or they're going to be separate files, we're going to go through that exercise. Um, I'll just, for the sake of time, just upload one. They can select what they're actually uploading. So in this case, it's architectural drawings, and then I submit for review. Do you, I really want to submit it? Yes, I do. And then the key here is it says it's under review and it's been um, submitted successfully. One of the keys is that, um, we'll see, we got a new email here. There's email notifications now to staff uh, as well as says a new application has come in. So this will go to a group of people that are doing, in this case, the pre-screen, so that they'll know that there's, there's uh, items in the queue for them to review. Another example of uh, what they have the ability to do, sorry, let me just go back for a quick second. So I can go look at, I'm logged in still as the applicant, and I can go and look at my applications. So in this case, this 1436 Argyle is the one that I just submitted. I can go look and see what the status of that is. But I also see, oh, I've uh, submitted this application for uh, 3398 Highland Drive, which is in revise and resubmit <coughs> status. So I can click on that. And it actually shows me it's revise and resubmit um, and gives me some instructions on what I need to do. I then have the ability to actually upload revised drawings. I see comments from staff as well as we, we're creating a corrections letter here. So what this does is it takes the notes and formats it into a, into a proper letter. This was something that the plans, review, uh, the plans examiners did by hand previously where they transposed all their notes from, from their paper um, plan reviews into a Word document that then they submitted to uh, back to the applicant. So I can download that. And if I open it, you can see that all those notes that were on there and it shows the specific files and the comments. One of the other things is that, um, as I mentioned, the applicant will get a notification that says, oh, your plans have been approved or your plans have been, uh, a, a, a revise and resubmit has been requested. In the case of the, them being uh, reviewed and complete, they'll get this, it says plan review. Let me just zoom in a little bit. So it says plan review complete. They'll actually see their approved plans. This, in this case, this shows them the plans that they've submitted and their approved plans. And then what they can do is they can click on that, download it, open it up. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but right now, as a sample, we're watermarking the, the PDF drawings with a, an approved stamp. So it shows them that these are the actual approved drawings. So, going back to the slide presentation, uh, currently in terms of the Bentley solution, what we're working on is we're, we're integrating into the Amanda permitting system. So that's the, the, the system that uh, Jim mentioned that we've been using for quite some time that has all of the permit processes within it. We're also integrating it with Bluebeam, which is the tool that, that Daryl presented so that those, those plan reviews that the staff are doing can actually be integrated into the system and it pulls in those comments that are being entered. We're adjusting the system based on process enhancements, so um, uh, planning and development is currently going through some process reviews and, and, and changing some of their business processes, so we're adjusting the system to, ma to mimic those as best we can. And we're going through system testing and configuration. In terms of next steps for Bentley, uh, we're going to develop the branding and the communication and the promotional materials. So corporate communications has, has started that for us, but we're going to be working very closely with them. A lot of the email notifications we have to go through and confirm all the wording and everything that uh, works best for the public to make sure they understand it. We're going to go through staff training and documentation. Um, and then we're going to uh, select an external group uh, to pilot the single family developments and single family permits and take it through its paces. And that's basically it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You. Uh, good information there. I know uh, Councillor Asmundson has uh, comments or questions. And
Well, more comments. I, I can, I've been waiting. To, I've been pushing for this for a number of years. It's listed under a C party, but I always thought it should be more of an A party because the initial push for this, this part of what you've explained here, is to speed up the process within planning development, uh, free up staff time so all departments can be looking at these drawings and making comments in, in, in one time. So that's great to see, but you know, seeing today now through demonstration the complexity that goes on behind the scenes and what you guys all have to go through gives us a better understanding of the time and the care you got to take to get it right here. So um, I'm looking forward to, to this, the 2018, hopefully everything works well, but it's, it's quite impressive on how it's going to cut down on paper, it's going to make, uh, I think for everybody, internally and externally and I think the one thing now is that you know we've always had complaints about the cities from different groups both taking too long but now with the the Bentley system you can better track you can go back and forth we'll know exactly if it's us or it's them out there and so I think that's going to create some honesty in, in how things are tracking so we, if it's us we can look at ways of immediately trying to fix it if it's, it's them we can say well there's problems out there so I really think there's a lot of good pieces to this puzzle <coughs> And I'm, I'm quite pleased to see where you're at. And I agree with the go-slow approach because, you know, you want to get it right. And you also want to get staff to believe in it when it goes forward. And it looks like through your presentation, staff are going to really like this. I do, yeah. It's, 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 made, a, it's made a number of tasks during plan reviews a lot, you know, like a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That's a good. Thank you. Great. Yeah, Councillor Cirillo. Well, I just want to say I always enjoy Mr. Von Temple's presentations. You have a great way of making complicated information uh, easy to understand. Thank you for the other two presentations today. Um, my question is just around the quality assurance, the debug that you were talking about. Um, I used to do quality assurance for software and I'm just wondering, will be, you mentioned in one of your last sentences that we're going to pilot it and take it through paces, so will we have documentation of all the steps that are taken and so we can recreate as things happen out in the field there, or what is the plan as far as that? Because I think this is all mark in market software, so it's just about how it's being applied by users, right? Yeah, we've got um, two tracking documents that we're managing right now through the project. Uh, one is a, an issues log that we are sharing with the software vendor Bentley and keeping track of everything that we're finding and everything that they're fixing. In addition to that, we've got a fairly um, robust test uh, log that we've created or test script, which uh, is going to test, uh, formally test all of the scenarios. Um, the interesting thing with the test log is it includes um, what they are referred to as negative scenarios, so things that we know they sh people Could shouldn't be able to do, yeah. and we want to make sure and test that they can't do that. So we've got um, uh, that that's in the works that we are continuing to log uh, information in. So we've got a fairly formal process that we're going through for QA and testing. Okay, that's good to know. So any chance that counselors can have a play with it at some point in time? <laughs> no. We could look at that, yes. No. Just the external, right? Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to come on and try to, through the Bentley, obviously not the blue beam, but through the Bentley, right, so that we have an understanding when people talk to us what mm -hmm. what it looks like and feels like to go through the scenario. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was good work there. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I believe we're going to go back to a uh, previously scheduled uh, delegation. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, prior to moving on to item four, perhaps as I see that the delegation is attended, we can move back to item two. Um, so item two is a delegation from Lisa Chessery from the Tiny House Foundation. She will be presenting a safe, affordable, and sustainable tiny house option. Please join us. Yep, we got another chair here. Would like to join us? And Mike is there. Thank you for coming in today. Well, Good thanks again for having, and, having uh, us. You have today. five minutes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we are the Tiny House Festival Foundation. We incorporated uh, eight months ago with the mission of uh, legalizing tiny houses. Not just tiny houses on wheels, but tiny houses in general, like micro homes, proponing, proposing 
uh, tiny house communities or co-housing of micro homes uh, with the idea of like affordable projects. Um, we would like to present today uh, two projects. Uh, the first one is the possibility to create a tiny house community of micro homes in Coquillam. Uh, will be mainly uh, micro homes of, uh, between 400 square feet and 800 square feet on small strata lot. Uh, we would like as a group to co-purchase uh, a parcel of land and ask your help to instruct the city staff in order to create a new zoning to accommodate a tiny house community. Um, the idea is uh, to create mainly like a bare strata land uh, where we're going to be uh, administrating uh, this mo uh, micro homes. We will connect, uh, we will build on foundation, we'll connect to Miss Valley, LCC Water and Sewer. And um, the idea is basically to uh, bring down the cost to uh, almost building a tiny house for $40,000, $50,000. Yes. Oh, no. I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish the then sure. we'll, we'll allow extra time afterwards. For sure. For so this is uh, the first project. Uh, I don't know if there is a way to slide the yeah. deck. Oh, sorry. So this is what uh, we're envisioning, you know, some of the pictures of uh, micro homes that we have in mind. This is a model that goes for like 30,000. It's um, up to standards, the building code, up to the building code. And um, it goes right on foundation. It can be built directly from an owner and can be ordered online. So this is one idea. There are other ideas that we have in mind. Uh, this is really to create like uh, an affordable housing project that yeah, that a lot of people have been dreaming about. This is an idea of what it should look like with uh, a road that connects all the lots um, with some garden and uh, as well like uh, a tiny home on it. And the second project, if I have a few more minutes, Please. is uh, a pilot project. Uh, there are existing tiny house owners Living on uh, living in Coquillum, they are parked illegally in Coquillum. They have uh, their tiny house on wheels parked, you know, uh, secretly. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And they've joined our organization mainly to ask if there was a possibility to uh, create a pilot project in order to um, park them legally somewhere in the city of uh, Coquillum. So if the city owns municipal lands, we, uh, and if there was this suitable land, we would like to consider an arrangement where we could pilot for two years and create a tiny house community made of like existing tiny, home, uh, existing tiny homes, provided that these tiny homes will be inspected to you know, envision that they're actually up to the standards. Uh, they can be... Uh, replacing their composting toilets uh, with uh, flushing toilets and to be hooked up to electricity, sewer, and water to the, to the city. So this is our second project. Uh, so basically we're here to ask for two projects, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, before I continue forward, is there any questions on this? Sure, I'll, maybe I, I know I've got a list here, so your questions, I'm sort of making those, but if you want to just finish, if there's anything else that you want to say, you may, that some of them may be covered, and then I'll go around the table with questions. Yeah. Um, so I would say like the main, uh, the main reason why we're pushing for this is uh, we're seeing more and more like a need for affordable housing. Nowadays, we're looking at income, an average income that doesn't allow you to even qualify for a mortgage for a, for a condo unit in Coquillam. Not just in Coquillam, like everywhere in, uh, in Metro Vancouver. So a lot of people are going out there, you know, in desperate need and building their own tiny houses and parking themselves, just making their own secret arrangements, you know, uh, right, left, and center. And that obviously doesn't does it put you know safety, uh, uh, safety and inspections and all sorts of problems out there? As a as a community, as a foundation, we're trying to move for a compromise where we come forward and we work together to both pilot 
with existing uh, tiny house owners that are willing to have their instructor, their unit to be inspected and be, you know, to the code, you know, so that they could be coexisting within a neighborhood uh, in Coquillum, as well as looking for an actual tiny house uh, community made of micro homes that it's affordable, it's, uh, uh, it's made of people that are actually building their own homes all together and on strata land so that could be affordable for their pocket. Uh, and we've seen more and more that there is no, no I mean, there, there is need for that. Yeah, I'm gonna, I've got a number of questions. I'm going to start with Councillor O'Neill, and then I've got Mayor Stewart and Councillor Marsden. So, uh, Councillor O'Neill. Thanks for the presentation. And my council colleagues know that I've been uh, talking about uh, this uh, issue for several months now, trying to see if we can make the put them a more friendly destination for tiny homes. So I really welcomed uh, your presentation today. Are you making this presentation just to Coquitlam specifically? Or are you making the rounds and going to lots of different municipalities at making the same ask? We actually went across Canada, believe it or not. We did 11 presentations in all the cities. And where I can tell you is affordable housing is an issue everywhere across Canada. And we live in Vancouver. We started this group in Vancouver. And there's been a huge amount of members appealing for help, asking for from any single municipality in Metro Vancouver, asking us to go and talk to councils. That's, we're starting with you guys, but we're continuing, you know, with Maple Ridge tomorrow, and we're gonna continue with uh, with the Sunshine Coast, Gibson, Seashells, anywhere where our members are asking us to help them. Thank you. Now I'm gonna ask uh, our staff uh, some questions and then you'll probably like to hear the answers to these yeah. and I'd like to know them too. So uh, Mr. McIntyre's our uh, general manager of planning and development. The white shirt there, the short sleeves. Um, now on the, on the first proposal, Mr. McIntyre, the one for to modify zoning to allow micro homes of between 400 and 800 square feet on foundations and on strata lots, um, is, there, is, there, is this allowed now? Would, do we need to, do we have, let's say, a minimum home size? I know we don't have a minimum condominium size. Uh, developers could uh, have little mini micro suites if they want to, and uh, I've checked into that before. Do we have minimum size for uh, ground oriented units? Uh, how does it, what would be on the first one? What would be the impediments or the changes you'd have to look at or we'd have to consider to allow this first one, this uh, small strata lots, small homes? Sure. Um, <clears throat> through the chair, um, let me provide some initial comments. I've, uh, we were aware of the presentation was being made and uh, Jim Bontempo is with me here this afternoon. He's more the expert in the, on the building structure and code side, so uh, he can go into more detail. But uh, uh, just a quick response would be, and obviously we'd want to sit down with the delegation and better understand what exactly they're proposing, but um, th we do ha the city does have zoning that may accommodate what's being proposed, particularly the last one with the, um, the, the basically the small units on wheels, that would be like in a mobile home park. We have mobile home park zoning. Yes. Um, around the other, um, if the... Um, the structure is going to be placed on a, um, on a, a permanent foundation and it's going to meet building code and that. Um, we do have some zones there. We do have a, a zone that's used for uh, bare land strata, for example, and, and that could, could probably fit with that. Um, I think that the challenge with the other one would be finding uh, a suitable property that could be rezoned as such to that. Uh, as we're well aware, there's a real uh, uh, pressure on, on land in Coquitlam right now. So um, there's nothing I could point to that in terms of sites that have existing zoning that may be uh, a test case. When is allowed to have a small strata lot of 2,500 square feet? Uh, that's allowed now or? Well, that, um, okay, in that case, no, there would probably be, um, it's in the lot size, like even with a bare land uh, strata subdivision, there's still minimum lot sizes that are prescribed. I, I can't remember offhand, but it's, it's, it's less than a single family fee simple, but there still is a minimum size. Um, it's, it's more the, the zone, if it wasn't to be um, bare land strata, there, that, there would probably be a zone that would, would work within. But again, we want to talk with the uh, proponent about that. And, and the second one, I thought, was very similar to um, mobile home, and I, and I did recognize that we have mobile home. Uh, that's correct. Um, 
That's good. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to, to talk with them after they finish doing the rounds and yeah. have some time because this is something I think more and more young people are looking at, um, especially younger people. It's a, a young friend that I have is really uh, wanting me to, uh, to uh, look into this and advance the cause if I can. If I could, Mr. Chair, one, one thought that didn't uh, cross my mind in, in watching the presentation, and again, I'd, I'd want to talk further with the, uh, the delegation and, and, and with staff, but uh, uh, as Council's aware, uh, through our Housing Choices Program some years ago, we uh, allowed for both a, a carriage house, that's basically a living quarters above a garage, and a garden cottage. Now, with what's being proposed in that first scenario, may fit within what would be a, a garden cottage. Now, that wouldn't be a separate tenure would be a, a second unit on an existing lot, but that there's an option possibly there it too. Would, it would seem to me that uh, when we allow a large single family lot in southwest Coquitlam to have four cottage type homes, and that, we've got examples of that, remember we toured one on Miller a little while ago, the first completed project, um, there's no difference between a little cottage and a, a, a tiny home, and that those are sitting on one uh, one what used to be one single family home. So yeah. I don't know if they would need to have six six tiny homes on there instead of four, but uh, to make it work for them, um, I've been interested in exploring all that. Of course, there's Especially all the issues of parking and <laughs> things like that that come up. So yeah, thank you. That's, that's all. Yeah, thank you, I've got Mayor Stewart. Next, it's funny that Councillor O'Neill referred to the cottage type homes. They're 2,200 square feet. They're three times as big as the house I grew up in. Um, which was a, a modest home, obviously the smallest house at the time. NHA had the rules. The NHA limited house size to 880 square feet if you wanted a CSA approved mortgage. Um, and there's a lot of the homes in Coquitlam and the older parts of Coquitlam were built to the NHA standards of uh, 880 square feet. Um, but we're talking half that size. And, um, and then we're also talking about the possibility of going below that. And so that's always been an issue that governments, not local, well, it's not like local government, but governments establish these minimum unit sizes um, of trying to protect um, consumers from the, their ultimate, their, ultimately their decision to move into a smaller home than that. And uh, those, those barriers are sometimes harder to remove than the municipal zoning. The municipal zoning, I suspect, would be an issue. You're not talking about Z240 or uh, CSA um, 8277 or those kinds of mobile home standard homes. You're talking about a building code home. We're open to consider the building code or the CSA standards um, 8240, right? Is that 277? 277, yes. That's the one. I mean, ideally, we, we would like, as owner uh, of the land, we would like to be able to have an on-site construction place where we could be manufacturing our own home, like build our own home. So be, you're, you're talking about site built on a foundation rather than, or as an alternative, a, a home built to mobile home standards and movable. I'll just chime in that we're, in general, we've been looking at both options because the A277 is about certifying how the house was built. You can both certify something built to the building code or you can certify it built to the, the other CSA standard, the Z240, generally MH, yeah. the manufactured home one, mm -hmm. which has insulation, unlike the RV one, which doesn't. Yeah. Um, so both are options. Um, in a number of cases, you can construct something for less money if you make it in a factory and then move it to site rather than build it on site, which is why we've been looking at trying to do things to the local building code, but following, but using uh, the A277 to do part of that certification in a factory before it gets moved to the site. Okay. Um, you've also got some, some documents to support the thing, including one that I, I assume is rural because it has a septic field and, oddly enough, a, a water well that's in the middle of a septic field. And, uh, I, oh. th those don't typically work as well. <laughs> but um, but in, in an urban setting, we're talking about one of the big issues being parking. Uh, you're, you argue perhaps that we could forego parking. Um, uh, uh, on some of these things, you'd be talking about parking taking up more room for the parking than for the footprint of the building, if we did require parking. 
again, we're open to discuss what the best option is in terms of parking. And if we have to have the parking underneath the house, we'll have to work in hope with that at this point. <laughs> or, or anything that could work within those uh, square, the square footage. I mean, we're open to to make it happen. Because that's where I was going. Because obviously if we can park it underneath the house, then we can augment the densities much more than uh, if we have to park surface. Um, our, the challenge, of course, is that neighborhoods don't accept density. And it's usually based on unit count, not based on the, uh, the size of the buildings. Uh, as I say, those four single-family homes on a lot up in on Miller are uh, 2,200 square feet. They're you know, an 1,100 stacked um, uh, box. And we're talking about much smaller and therefore potentially much many more units. Um, one of the key driving key drivers, of course, is the, or rather the key driver isn't the cost per square foot of construction, which is um, hasn't changed much more than the rate of inflation for for the last several decades, but the cost of land, which has been increasing by ten or fifteen or twenty percent a year. So um, getting more density on the site would be better, and that would imply a. a the lower grade, the below grade road, and the and driveways into basements. possibly. Yeah. Yes. Um, how did other communities receive your presentation? Because I, I mean, I, it's something I've been driving, pushing for for thirty years, and it, and it falls on it falls on if planners embrace it with a smile quite often. <laughs> like that. Well, it's <laughs> funny. Like uh, we're. We were thrilled to see how Winnipeg and Revelstoke in BC or Nelson, BC, re responded to us. Uh, I mean, Revelstoke has just 70,000 people, practically. And sure enough, you know, there were like over 100 people at our presentation because the young workers there in, in Revelstoke, you know, working on the, on the hills, they're actually sleeping in the cars. They, there is no accommodations for them available. There is just the big monstrosity chalets built up, you know, for the Americans or, you know, the Canadians that they go there, out there, you know, for, for the ski resort trip. And there's nothing else for the workforce. The workforce has nowhere to go. And there's, it's not like Whistler where you have Squamish and then everybody goes, you know, to either Squamish or commutes to Pemberton. You have nothing. Revelstoke is practically two hours away from Golden. It's, you know, again, another small little town. And that's where you see these people picking up their own, in a, by own initiative and building up, you know, uh, caravans, you know, like tiny homes and parking just outside the boundary of the city limits. And there was a director of economic Devo development person at the meeting telling us, you probably have to become your own developer in order to make this happen. You have to come together as a group and as a developer, you know, prop probably like get the money together to buy uh, land and subdivide it so that you can make this happen. No other developers will actually produce an affordable housing project for you because there is no por there is no margin, there is no profit for that. This is why, as a known for profit, we're advocating for educating ourselves and putting out there tools and documents and pilots that can educate anyone in Canada to be able to do that. So we've put together. I'm just going to slide to the last um, slide here. Just a one-page document to educate people on, like, well, potentially, you know, if you were to buy a piece of land, you know, there was the cost of, like, you know, $1.5 million, and you were to subdivide, say, in 30 lots, potentially, you know, by a budget of, like, $50,000 a lot, you could have a micro home, you could be affordably living, you know, and building your own tiny house. It requires obviously that you need to find that piece of, that parcel of, lot, that parcel of land, you need to find, you know, people willing to do this with you and, and willing to build your own affordable housing. But we're not far from reaching the desperation of what people are already doing themselves. So why not doing this, you know, as a pallet somewhere where we could reach this compromise? Yeah, and I and I wish it was in Coquitlam, and I'm not not dismissing it, but I'm hope, I'm hopeful. But um, you know, certainly, if you look at maximum price one point five million for two acres. That's that's in mission. 
We're not saying Mission. It's not in Coquitlam. In Coquitlam, it's you wouldn't be able to get one acre for one point five million. Um, the servicing costs would be much higher than that because for sure. you know, underground wiring and uh, the sort of thing we're looking at. Uh, that's one of the challenges of laneway housing in Vancouver is that servicing is almost as much as the as the laneway house. Um, and in the end, uh, I, I mean, I absolutely think this is something that we we do it now. We actually have under your definition of micro homes, we have micro homes. They're called uh, carriage homes, and we put the parking underneath them. It's not underground. It's it's surface, just underneath, surface yeah. parking, and we put a micro home on top of it, and call it a carriage home. And that's much of Millardville now is starting to embrace the micro home. We've got Burke Mountain embracing it, but it's one unit per per lot as a an add on to an existing single family. It's not a a subdivision of them, and that's going to be the biggest barrier. Is if we decide to try to do more than even more than two on a lot, then I think we end up with uh, res you know, resistance to the familiar character of single-family neighborhoods. And, and uh, while I want to push that, I, and I know there are members of council who would like to push that, it's going to be, that's going to be the NIMBY element. I agree. At the same time, I feel like, you know, uh, we're here to present in order to <laughs> Sort of test the water, you know, like in every single municipality, and maybe not be Coquillum, but. I, and I applaud you. I'll let the next speaker go, and I may have some more, but I thank you very much for coming out, by the way. Yeah. Okay, I've got Councillor Marsden, then Councillor Zarello. Great. Um, I'll start by saying I'm probably the only one around the council table that's lived in a tiny home. Um, the first home I had with my wife was a float home in Cole Harbor, and it was about 450 square feet on two levels. And you can certainly live quite comfortably in that. It's just a very different than the in excess of 3,000 square feet we now occupy. Um, so I, I think this is great. There are some challenges, as, as uh, some have alluded to. So would you see these as being like within an infill subdivisions where as the mayor has talked about the neighborhood attached residential areas that we have where it's you know a standard you know eight ten thousand square foot lot where you can put two or three of these together or four of them or is this you really need some acreage to to, to put the density to make the the scalability i'll just say work? i think the short version is because of the nimbyism because of the resistance to any change even carriage houses and laneway houses in vancouver They've been coming along, but it's been slow. Even yeah. that level has gotten some resistance from the neighbors. I think trying to do this infill within a neighborhood, well, I think it's great from increasing density in a city. It, I think it has potential. I think the resistance from the immediate neighbors might be too great as that being the first step. So I think as a first step, you might do better by creating a small community in one area that can then take advantage of some of these Okay. Efficiencies in development. In okay. fact, because there, there certainly is efficiencies when you when you look at the scalability of it. And so that, that was a question because um, Councillor O'Neill spoke about uh, an example on Miller, and we look and I think believe the zoning there uh, under under that is about seventy seven hundred square foot minimum lot size to put in a quadruplex that's detached. So you're looking at about nineteen hundred square feet per unit of, of land. So you know your thoughts of twenty five hundred square feet don't seem that far out in terms of an ask, in terms of, you know, do we have an ability to embrace something like that? I think as a city we probably have. The challenge is cost. Um, and I, I think what you've got there, I was I mean, really happy to see that piece. We talked about the criteria for the land and the costs. I'd encourage you to take a look at really what are the implications given the, the urban area that we're in um, and, and the land costs. We are seeing 1.2, 1.3 million right now for an infill that's 8,000 square feet. So what would it look like? How would that impact your overall numbers? If you looked and said, if there were an area that were two to three acres and you wound up having to pay you know, $5 million, what does that do for your cost per unit? Does that make it, does that still fit the affordable range that you're trying to achieve? Um, again, I only offer that as, as you start to have your presentation for different size cities and yep. different areas and different land costs, I think it'll resonate that, that little bit more. Um, off the top of my head, I would look and say that given the land costs where we're at, um, when you factor everything, you're probably looking roughly around the same cost as a small condominium. Different lifestyle than a tower. And so some people might look there, but again, from an affordability piece, 
is it achieving exactly what you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. um, and so really it just comes down to me is that, you know, if your, your question to us is would we, would we be open to something like this? I, I absolutely would be open to something like this. Okay. The, the challenge to me is can you make your numbers work? Can, can, you, can you then identify a chunk of land, a, a parcel, how big a parcel do you need, how many units per acre, and then what's your end result going to be? Is it going to, you'd be able to sit there and say, you know what, if we do this, it is going to fit that affordability. The number you got there is 130000 That wouldn't be the number here in Coquitlam. I would suggest that I agree. given the cost, it's probably at least double and perhaps as much as three times that number. So um, if we could, if you could figure that out and, and staff's willing to have that, that dialogue, I think that would be a, a neat conversation to have. Mm -hmm. okay. I think you've hit on the key part that I think it needs to be a dialogue because on Absolutely. one hand, we can come up with those numbers but until we know what type of density a city is or is allowed is open to allowing. It becomes difficult, so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. There, of, there is. I you need to figure out what zoning well, you're we, open to, and and that's maybe this ongoing discu this we, larger well, discussion with staff to yeah. try and figure out: is there a, a density that can suit, can yeah. keep the costs down, that still addresses the. Well, you might have to revisit your 2,500 square feet per, per unit and, and yeah. bring that downward. You look at where we're at yeah. and in, in these NARs, 7,700 square feet, and you can put 400, four units on it. Again, if we can. So we're looking at 1,900 square feet. So, again, that could help with your cost per unit piece. Um, and, and, again, it, it, it certainly makes sense if you had an area where you could, you know, two yeah. or three neighbors got together and you got, wind up with getting an acre, now you can put 15 units in as opposed to. You know, three That's or four, yeah, cool five. Yeah. But again, depending on setbacks, parking requirements, one car, two cars per unit, some That's of those all discussions stuff you have to, all play all into stuff that. Have to so work through, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Councillor Cirillo. Thank you very much. Innovation is always fun. Appreciate it. And if there's any developers watching this, it might be fun to actually have some tiny houses in condo, in condo towers where people can do their own... Uh, Interiors. That might be a marketing tool that they could use that might actually end up being cheaper than a tiny house. Um, the comments I wanted to make, thank you for coming in. We're, we're more to staff. Um, we have a housing affordability strategy where a couple of us have tried to tap into it over time, uh, and we've been told every time that this housing affordability strategy is closed, and unless we want to reopen the housing affordability strategy, this isn't really the time to talk. But I think here's another example of where maybe this could be part of housing choices where we could actually open up the housing affordability strategy to take in some new and innovative ideas. So those are my comments and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Asmussen for again. It's your proposal. I think it's good for you guys to work out some of your issues and stuff with the planning department. I, I will say though the land cost is probably it's one of your biggest issues in Coquitlam. And Coquitlam right now you're looking anywhere for a service lot between eight hundred and nine hundred thousand dollars per lot. So on, a, on one acre, you're, if it's uncovered, you're going to get eight units per acre at eight to nine hundred thousand dollars. So that gives you a rough idea of what your land cost would be on a service lot. And so I think you'd want to sit down with a pine park. It's an interesting type of idea, but does it create enough density on the land base to make the cost work, even at a, at a, a tiny home? whether it's on foundation or on wheels, does it work in Coquitlam with the land cost being that. So I think you want to take that away, look at that land cost in Coquitlam, because I know you're going everywhere, and this is one of the cities you're coming to. It's an interesting concept. Um, we have a strategy that I think is working well right now in our affordable housing. We are achieving some good things here. This may not be, because the biggest driver in all this thing the mayor talked about is strictly the land cost here, and being the impediment it can be to certain types of ground-oriented attempts just because of the cost and what effect it will have on the whole overall end unit price and the ability to find that land somewhere to be done for that. So I would, that's just a rough estimate of what you're looking at land cost-wise to help you out. But I'm sure Mr. McIntyre and staff will be willing to help you and peruse your, your concerns about what would it take to bring something like this into equipment. Or most of these will probably be similar, even going through our plan, will similar requirements within neighborhoods because parking is always an issue in neighborhoods. Yeah. The level of density, the service connections, the sidewalks, whatever, it's all involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you for uh, for coming in today. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'll get one last one. There, Stuart. Sorry, I did want to come back to uh, one last element of it. Of course, is the private road, public road stuff. You you've designed your, I think, your parcel to have to front against public roads. To, in other words, none of the land that you're using is 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 dedicated as roadways, and that's uh, a challenge. So we we actually do this particular development all the time. Oops. I'm sorry. The one you had there. This one. No, no, no. The one you just had. Uh, this that one, one here? Yeah, sorry, yeah. That's a 30 foot lot. It's, um, it's a, a home in the front, and typically it's a garage in the back where there's a, where there's a lane. Um, the density that we can achieve on those isn't 15 units to the acre. It's, you know, we, we might be able to get to 11 or 12. Um, 11 or 12. But, but, it's, but that's partly because we have to dedicate the roadways in order to be able to create that. <clears throat> if your parcel had road access, or if you're able to do private road instead of public road, because private roads can, like mobile home parks, have a 20-foot road or a 30-foot road rather than a 66-foot road allowance, um, more like a lane. So that's among the components that would have to be achieved here. And I would love to see someone figure out how to do a private road down a wider, say, an 80-foot lot, a private road with the way that other the, the other one uh, was shown, um, and homes around the outside, but make but make them small footprint homes. We don't, you know, a twenty by twenty, uh, or in this case twenty by twenty-five. That's not a, an unusually small uh, footprint. It's uh, twenty by twenty-five produces a, a, a one thousand square feet over two stories, or if you can get a basement in, uh, obviously a little bit more living area. Um, would you would you intend for suites in them at all, or these are these are simply? Yes. No, no, no. We definitely. You, well, sorry, you're asking it's multiple suites within multiple the same suites, unit. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the most part, we've been looking Probably at not. separate units um, because, again, sort of the bare strata makes some of the funding easier because if we want to do multiple suites within one unit, then we need to, let's say, coordinating the financing is a little bit more more complicated from and the parking point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, again, thank you very much for, for presenting this. This is um, an ongoing discussion that we've had for many years, uh, and uh, it's always worth contemplating it, and uh, particularly worth it if, if a not-for-profit proponent can come to us with a, an actual plan, and we can work out some details and see if a test product can be, can be brought to bear getting the land component down to a, say 150 or hundred thousand dollars per unit including servicing and then you do, do two and a half times that and you're at a quarter million for a, a small home but nonetheless a home that a young family can uh, yeah. can raise a family in. I guess that we're willing to bring it back to the group and mm -hmm. and yeah. do and that research. I'll just point out one thing that in our group we definitely do get the young people we do get the 20 somethings that look at the housing market and say by the time I paid off my student debt, if I then get into a 30-year mortgage, then I'm at 60 by the time I'm starting to save for retirement, and this is going to be a problem. We also get people in the 50-somethings that sit there and say, most of my money is tied up in my house. I'm house rich and cash poor. I want to downsize, but I'd like to stay in the same community. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing in the community that I can afford because all the housing prices have gone up. So we actually have both ends of this, this spectrum here because there is the, the other side where if the kids have left, people who really do want to move into a smaller space but stay close to their friends, stay close to support services, do a variety of these things, and there is that other need um, that also exists at that end of, of the spectrum as well. Um, I don't think our housing market has served people very well. Uh, no, I mean, no, it's not. It's not working now. And I'll make my last comment is: I, I was one of my clients way back several decades ago was Jenish House Design, and we did we did a lot of work in Japan, designing neighborhoods in Japan, and and they were designing single family neighborhoods at 22 units to the acre, um, which is, and we designed them at four or six or sometimes as you know eight units to the acre. Uh, clearly, this this isn't reinventing the wheel. This is in some ways just adapting um, from places where land has always been precious and where we haven't been able to use uh, quarter acre density uh, ever. And so 22 units to the acre was considered a, a pretty luxurious neighborhood. So. Yeah, Tokyo standards, four tatami per person for a residence. Yeah. So these yeah. desks, that's us. Yeah, you know, there you go. Two desks, there we go. That's the two of us. So thank you very much for coming in. Um, I think some good ideas, some things we've heard before. We're, we're all wrestling with this, and I, so I appreciate you coming in with some ideas. I think certainly uh, you, you know, we have some 
some work to do on, on some of your numbers, but uh, I think you're, you're certainly you know, going the, in the right direction what you're trying to do. Um, I heard you say that you want to have a discussion. Um, we had that discussion here. We started it. I think this is just the start of a dialogue. I hope it is. Um, I think uh, our staff heard us asking questions. I think there's some interest uh, in at least getting more information and having you meet with our staff. And I, I see nods around the table. I see nods from staff. So I think that today you've, uh, you've begun that dialogue. I see cards being exchanged. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll hear more in the, in the future from you and from our staff. So thank you very much for coming in. I move we do it. Item four is the building permits for tenant improvements, approval process improvements. We have introductory comments by the general manager planning and development, and the report is before you for information. I think Meadowbrook could be planning all the time today. It's been a long day. Welcome back. I do think so too. Mr. McIntyre. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we don't have a presentation, but I do have some uh, introductory comments, and then certainly we're uh, um, open to uh, any question or feedback from committee. Um, <clears throat> Just um, to note, earlier this year, uh, concerns were expressed about the uh, the city's TI building permit processes. Uh, TI stands for tenant improvement, and that's uh, um, <clears throat> typically um, building permit applications that are for finishing off or renovating an existing space or unit in, a, in an existing building. And it uh, typically is attached to a new business getting started. So there's uh, uh, it's very uh, time critical and. Uh, um, and there's considerable pressure on all the parties uh, uh, in these situations to uh, get on, get the, the TI prepared, get a process, get it issued, do the work, open for business. So uh, we all understand that. <clears throat> um, so as we are aware of this, and, and uh, <clears throat> we um, uh, undertook a, a review of our uh, tenant improvement uh, BP processes, and this is part of a broader review we're doing of other development application uh, processes as well. Um, that, by the way, we'll be reporting back. We're targeting uh, coming back to Council before the uh, summer break, uh, probably late in, in, in July. There'll be a, a presentation on that, too. So I think that, that was uh, noted earlier in the afternoon. We are talking about the e-plan um, uh, presentation. There's that, that other process review is underway. So um, <clears throat> it's part of a department-wide uh, focus on, uh, on uh, uh, customer service efficiencies. Um, so with regard to the TIA BP improvement process, uh, Jim Bontempo, our, our building permits manager that's responsible for the plans examination and, and BP issuance, his staff, um, they took on the project. And uh, just a real quick summary of what was done. Um, they surveyed a sample group of about 20 uh, TI uh, uh, applicants from last year, just to check back with them and see how they found the city's uh, uh, system and, and, and to seek their feedback and comments. Um, along with that, Jim and uh, senior staff in the Building Permits uh, Division um, we did some uh, reassessment of our, our TI processes, looking at them quite critically and, you know, what do we do and why? And uh, through that, uh, identified a number of actions to, uh, to both streamline and simplify those processes. So um, coming out of that, based on what we heard from the, the survey group, staff's own assessment, um, a number of uh, uh, process improvements have been uh, put in place or, and we're um, continuing to do that that um, will make the processes more straightforward, understandable and efficient. Um, for example, we're, we're doing one now that uh, <clears throat> it was determined that by spending a little bit more time with the applicant at the front counter when they come in, and if they have the drawings there, um, and, and staff just spend some time talking with them and understanding it, uh, we can in fact issue that TI permit at the counter at that time. And so that's, uh, uh, that's obviously very desirable. Um, but along with that, we're looking at, um, and Jim can go into more detail uh, around this, um, <clears throat> looking at uh, the bulk of the, the TI applications going through in fairly short order. I mean, short order is like five business days. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's the focus. And so we'll continue to uh, um, keep an eye on this. It's, it's monitored. We, we track our performance in this area. And uh, we will continue to make uh, improvements as need be. 
Thank you. Do you have anything to add, or should we go to questions? Or? I don't really have more to add, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sure. I've got myself and Councillor Sorrell. So I'm really pleased to see this, this coming forward, and uh, I understand that it, from what you're saying that we're going to be looking at other other areas as well. And uh, and I think that uh, you know, as uh, really I said, I've, some questions that I've come up with a couple of times over the years, and I think some of it was interesting to look at the comments. And I really appreciate that you've gone out, talked to some of our customers, and we got good comments, and we got some areas identified where we need some improvement. And I think some of the areas have identified. And need improvement. We're probably across a, a different processes as well, not just on the on the tenant improvement ones. Uh, the uh, one of the items we've listed here is the new goal is to process 80% of all applications of all TI applications within five business days. I think that's a great target. Um, just wondering, at some point, will we report out and be there in six months or a year just to see how we're doing and if we can meet that target? I think targets are great, but it's nice to know if we if we meet them. And uh, I hope that we can, uh, because that's, that's certainly an ambitious target, but I think one that our customers would appreciate. So that would be my first question. Is there there is a plan to report back? Or, I'd like to hear back. Uh, certainly, we, we can uh, <clears throat> we can commit to that. Um, but just ar around that, I, I, um, our, our thinking was that, um, and it was a bit of an education for me too, and sitting down with Jim and his staff, and, and uh, really understanding uh, the types of, of uh, TI applications. And um, we looked at it, and you know, you can look at uh, a standard bell curve in terms of you know the bulk is in the middle range, and so. You know, most of them should be there. But in, in, in talking with Jim and, and the other staff, it seems like a lot of them are, are towards the, the lower end, more simple end, straightforward end. So rather than the bell curve, we sort of shifted that curve closer in. So that, that was the idea of trying to get that earlier, um, focus on, on processing earlier than that. So um, the gymnast group will be monitoring the uh, the application times. Um, uh, right now we do do that by the seven main permit types, but I guess we can also break that out by the other categories. But maybe Jim can speak on that. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Um, <clears throat> you know, as the report mentioned, um, every week we go through all the numbers. We look at every permit stream. How are we doing? Could we move some, some of our staff from this area to that area? How are we doing? Vo vacation time, sickness, illness, all that. Um, and um, uh, we generate a report at the end of that. We have a table that we review and we put down the, the actual business days versus the target. So at any given time in the year, um, what we could do is make that available to council. Um, we can put it in your mailbag and you can see for yourself all seven or eight permit streams and how they're doing. And, um, you know, it, uh, this is something that never leaves, uh, senior management. And we're talking about it and Doug and I bring it up to Jim and talk it about, talk about it weekly as well. So, um, and, uh, and currently right, right now, TIs are running at less than five business days right now. Um, that in large part is due to staff and training. We're there. You know, we have six, six staff that are dedicated to commercial plan checking right now, fully trained after two or three years of working to get that there. And we feel really good about that. So we're, Right now, we can meet that, and we'd be happy to report that back. Okay. And that, those numbers were, not, were not, not always the case, so I know you've done a lot of work right. on that to get there, and we want to make sure, and I guess it's a case of, you know, with the resources, and I appreciate you try to make best use of the resources. In some cases, it's a matter of shifting around. It's good to know you're tracking them, so that now when you see an area that's falling behind that you do uh, deploy the resources, and I'm really I'm pleased to, to hear that. I also was really impressed when you said that you're doing more at the front counter, yeah. and I think that's key is to and to put them into the, the the fast stream if they're a simple one so they don't get bogged down I think that helps a lot um, and also the, uh, the taking the time to make sure that applications that are coming in are are complete and spending the time with them up front some cases these are not experienced people at the counter uh, and I know people have gone through this and they're very appreciative of, of the guidance and support that you've been able to give people at the counter and I think the other part I would add to this is it's one of the customer comments here 
here as well, is to try to make sure that up front we try to identify as best we can all of the things that they may need. Now, there's always that, oh, we opened up a wall or you didn't say you were going to do this, but just to try to spell it all out at the front so we don't get the, oh, you, didn't you know, you know, two weeks later. So I think that doing as much as you're doing at the front end, I think, is going to go a long way to, to streamlining. And I appreciate the fact that you're also, you know, beginning to track this and, and deploying the resources where needed. So I, I, this is great. I'm, I'm glad to see it. Um, and and I, I think if you use the same approach to some of the other uh, applications, that I think that this is going to bode well for us in the city. Thank you. If I could, Mr. Chair, yes, um, exactly. Um, and this is where I think a lot of this goes hand in hand. And, and uh, it was no accident. We were doing the, uh, the plan demonstration today because you know, it's, it's getting close to launch, but it, it's going to be a very uh, uh, incredibly powerful, helpful tool for these sort of, th these sort of processes um, where we'll have that ability to, to screen at the front end to make sure the applications coming in are complete and accurate. And, and, and that, by the way, is what we heard from the GV GVHBA when they were here about two months ago, um, pushing the city to, to, to set that standard. And through that sort of process or that system too, we can then track more closely how long it's taken taking, how we're performing, and if there are some lags, you know, where is that occurring and why? And so that yeah. allows us to zero in and deal with that too. So, so yes, um, just to reiterate what Jim said, we will report back, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that as we uh, put in place the e-plan system and roll that out across various application processes over time, we'll have that, that very powerful tool so we can have that more uh, Direct it, it might be I'm not looking for it on a regular basis. Just sort of a, yeah. hey, how are we doing? Did it work? Did the things you're trying to do, do you need more resources? Is it technology? It looks like from the earlier presentation, we're bringing some things on, on board. So I think that's that's where the direction we want to go. So thank you. I've got uh, Councillor Zarello and then Councillor Marston. Well, I have to stop Councilor. by saying again, Mr. Von Temple, every time I see a report, <laughs> I remember it from years back when I first came in. I just truly, truly appreciate it. And also Mr. Vance, too. I. Every time there's a problem, you have a solution, and I just can't say enough about it. Thank you. Um, totally, you're open to innovation and change. I just think it's great, and I actually want to congratulate you on the, the TI. I mean, when you get the numbers, lots of times our perception is something that's not necessarily true, and I really appreciate the actuals. Uh, I have two questions and two comments. Mm -hmm. What is the one-stop business startup program? Because I'm so interested in that. Yes, uh, through the chair. So um, <clears throat> about two or three years ago, uh, we worked with business license uh, staff. One of the biggest problems that we encounter with TI is it's, it's an interesting permit stream. It's very temperamental because you're, you're dealing with people who have just purchased or leased a property and I got to get a business going, as I mentioned. And, and many of these people are doing it for the first time. So uh, in terms of coming to the city, it becomes a customer service exercise. And, you know, up until a few years ago, it was basically, well, if you need a permit, you come here. If you need a business license, you go here. And if you need a sign permit, you go here. If you have a zoning question, go over there and on and on. You want to pay taxes, you go over there. And, it, you know, and, and it can be pretty bewildering. So we um, pieced together a brochure and we just started a lot of dialogue with business licenses and development planning and tried to put those three components, the signage, the business license, and the tenant improvement all in one because virtually uh, th those three really almost are required in every new business opening up. So uh, there is a brochure out there. We're working with them. Um, recently uh, with the new uh, liaison person being hired through business licenses. This is going to open up some more dialogue. Obviously, we're working even more closely with them now. We we have some ideas. We're starting to talk to them about updating that brochure and doing some other other exciting things. I mean, uh, we're inspired when you look at the city of Portland and look at their website, uh, for example. I mean, uh, you could basically walk in and they're begging you for business. They're they're basically what can we do to help you? And you know that. That's the message that staff uh, staff come to us from all walks of life, and they're all not customer service people. So that requires training and a culture that needs to be developed. And you know, we're, we're, as I mentioned in the report, where we need to go is we need our staff when they see a customer to not just say there's a person that needs a building code review. But it's also a person who's trying to set up the business in Coquitlam. It's a whole different game than dealing with a developer for a 29-story tower. Yeah. 
So it's it's a learning process, you know, and and um, and and so the one stop shop is what can we do to make it that easy for a person to set up a business. That's okay, that's or sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, Mr. McIntyre wanted to add and then say something. Then I'll go back to Councillor Cirillo. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I just want to uh, um, add on to uh, Jim's comments. Uh, actually, the report and Jim does point out these uh, connections with the other business areas, which coincidentally actually are on our floor too. So it is quite uh, convenient. Um, and uh, there is a, a committee that's being formed on that to um, ensure that there's a good connection between economic development, community planning, development planning, Jim's area, signs, business licensing. So we are working uh, closely and seamlessly together to uh, provide that positive, uh, welcoming, uh, uh, helpful experience for, uh, for new businesses. That's awesome. It's really great. Um, so then my second question just is just about that engineering. Is engineering part of that? Group, or is there a link to engineering at all? Because I sometimes get calls from business people that have an engineering issue too, and I usually just pass it to David, who I'll be giving some credit to in a minute. Um, engineering department rarely ever has anything to do with a tenant improvement. Um, if it's because there's a, a brand new connection to the building required a service connection, it's it's extremely rare. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, okay, so then I said I had two comments. One is about uh, Mr. Monroe, David Monroe from our economic development. I'm glad to hear he's on the new task force, and um, I just wanted to say that he has been wonderful every time I've had a call uh, in regards to tenant improvements, even new business. He's, he's been incredible and he's taken the lead. So I know he's not in the room, but... Mr. Guys is in the room. I didn't see you there. Um, and then I had one other comment. Oh, I love the tagline and would love to see it expanded across departments. Help us help you. Yeah. Is that already kind of being talked about? Um, yes, it's something that I'm always telling staff. Let's let's get them to help us help you. Right. Um, the uh, whether it turns into a nice formal tagline, we could see it. We'll probably get some copyright issues on that, but maybe we could develop something else. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's that philosophy, right? Which is um, uh, spending the time talking at the counter, an extra five or seven minutes may solve hours of problem down the road. It's just that simple. I think that what happens is in today's world, everybody's moving at a fast pace. Everything's fast. Everything's electronic. People are under, or corporations are understaffed. Everybody's in a hurry. And no one's taking the time to explain things. And that's just... Uh, endemic across the country and across the world. Maybe it just means slowing down a little bit. If our staff feel that they're under duress, <laughs> we need to slow down, <laughs> but hurry up at the same time. No, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is if staff feel that their work is being done and that they can spend a few more minutes at the counter without something else bothering them, it just adds to the experience of helping somebody and as customers we all know that we want people to spend more time helping us when we're a customer so well, okay. congratulations and thank you thank you very much i've got councillor marston and then councillor counter great uh, a couple quick things i like old councillor zirillo's comments about uh, interactions with mr bun temple and mr vance uh i have had uh, a number of business people come to me and they've had some challenges they've had some issues and and uh you guys have done a great job of helping helping resolve them. Thank you. Um, that said, I think one of the key points you've touched on in this report is that interaction at the front counter. So in the past 90 days, I've seen two situations that we've escalated to Mr. Vance, which really come to do with staircases on mezzanines, and they're more than 30 feet from a doorway, so fire code says, thou shalt not be more than 30 feet. Well, if the person knew up front yeah. at the front counter, it's stuff like that that yeah. they find out you know, two, three, four weeks into the process, yeah. and that's where the frustration comes in. Um, so I think it's, it's really good that we're focusing on the front end. Happy to see that we were 28% of the the applications in the last 90 days, roughly, um, were dealt with the same day at the counter, because I think that certainly is a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and a small sampling on this, but I think 
while not statistically valid, I think is probably good to give an indication of where we're at. We've got 11 people have come back and said, here's the experience we had. The question I would have would be, uh, I, I would suggest that perhaps the sole source of the majority of our TI requests are coming from Coquitlam Centre. Did we reach out directly to Coquitlam Centre to get some feedback from them in terms of where we're at and what they've experienced or their, their tenants have experienced? Um, yeah, through the chair, um, we asked uh, the consultant to, we gave him a list of 20, which was a scatter, a scatter sample right across. We pulled 20 of the most recent applicants that had completed their permit process with us. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't know why just 11 may have answered from Coquitlam Center. Because they're small business people and they're busy. Uh, yeah. They're running their business. They don't have time to fill out a form yeah. from the city or, or that because they're, they're focused on creating revenue. Yeah. In some cases, maybe they felt they waited too long for a permit, so they got to create the revenue. <laughs> uh, so um, I know from my time uh, engaged with the business community in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Coquitlam Center has had some challenges, I think, back to a number of years ago where they were seeing, on average, 12-week turnaround times on permits. Uh, and, and again, these aren't structural. These are your tenant, tenant improvements. And they'd actually run the numbers, and it was costing over a quarter million dollars a year in lost revenue, lost rental revenue, waiting for the permitting uh, permitting process. So um, the pieces you've talked about, to see 80% of them get to within five days, I think is spectacular. I think that's something you should celebrate and then and then report back out at. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage you to take a look at some of our major um, major shopping malls uh, and and those that have multi units and and communicate back to them mm -hmm. uh, because part of the process here is going to be changing the perception. Yeah. Okay. And if, if you can deliver eighty percent of the TIs in under five days, they need to hear that. Yeah. They need to hear that. They need to talk about what's been done and perhaps there's something on their end that they can better prepare their new tenant so that they know when they come to the city with the information they've got, they've got all the information. So again, working collaboratively with the business community, so let them help us, help us help you. Uh, I think it's... Uh, it's not a very good logo. It's not, no, and I'm not looking to create taglines because I, I don't think we need them, but uh, I think it's really a matter to look and say, let, let's look back to some of these key places. Start to change, start to create the messaging, to change the perception that's out there, and, and to truly support the change and say, are they working? Yeah. And if they're not, find out why. Yeah. So so we can move forward. Because, again, I, I would think that places like that, there's, um, there's there's quite a sample. You know, there's a lot of turnover in our malls. Yeah. And I think there's an opportunity there that typically they're not structural pieces being done. They are simple TIs yeah. Um, yeah. That, that need a simple, maybe a plumbing permit, right. but most likely just electrical, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thanks for the work on this. I'm, I'm happy to see the progress, and I, I look forward to seeing continued. And perhaps if you can take forward and just reach out to our, our friends. I know we've got a representative on Economic Development uh, yep. Committee. Uh, I'll be speaking to her directly, but I think it would be good that staff come back and share some good news story with her. Excellent. Yeah. Thank thanks, you. guys. Thank, thank you. I've got Councillor Zarello, or sorry, uh, Councillor Towner, and then Councillor. Uh, uh, I can see the So I've got Towner next, then Brent. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is great stuff. Uh, anything that improves processes, saves time, improves customer service, trains staff, and asks for feedback from the, you know, the customers, I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. For me to gain some understanding, I just have a couple of questions. So I thank you for providing the comments. But as I read some of them, um, like, for example, requirements for older buildings to meet modern standards in every way besides health and safety seem ridiculous or unreasonable. Some um, thought it was unfair that the, they were asked to bring it up to code when their neighbors didn't. Things like that. I, I kind of sense that maybe that implies that maybe our inspectors are going beyond the life, life safety, the fire safety parts of the code, which I think we should definitely bring up to code. And so my questions are, um, if we do, if we are pursuing compliance in the older buildings that aren't fire safety requirements, what kinds of items are these? And if they're not health and safety, is it reasonable to expect a commercial tenant to make these improvements? Mm -hmm. And then my last question is, does the city have the authority to go into an existing building and demand 
that is brought up to code if it isn't related to fire safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through the chair, good questions. Um, so question number one, um, the building code is updated and, and regenerated about every five, five years. And every code cycle comes with it, <clears throat> new rules. And um, historically, the code was really just um, health safety issues. Okay. Today, the code um, has included in it um, many other components, such as uh, uh, energy efficiency requirements. Uh, although they're not health safety issues, they're about comfort and quality uh, of life, and um, that is something that's been introduced to the code in about, I believe, 96 or, or sorry, no, about 20, 2012 cycle, I believe. Um, there is a lot more structural components due to the seismic requirements today, so earthquake-proof uh, or resistant buildings. Um, and there's, uh, you know, so all, what's happened over the recent years, the code is is a, a bigger catch-all for construction and the construction industry today. It's grown in size. It requires an awful lot more training and qualifications to look at and review. As you can imagine, um, you know, buildings as they age, the general rule and the, what the code says is that the code of the day will be applied to that structure. So if the building was built in 1968, <clears throat> quite often when we're reviewing an application, we look at the code version, the cycle that was in, uh, in operation at that time. Okay. But the code also talks about, um, that any improvements shall not make an existing situation any worse. <laughs> so you see what we're up against where there's, and this is where the difficulty comes with customers because what we're trying to do is look at the end product and say at the end of the day, is this a safe building to occupy? But at the same time, we're looking at it and saying, you know, if it's a 1965 building, are we going to make them up, uh, upgrade the entire mechanical ventilation system? You know, to today's code, you know, you're looking at perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars of upgrade. It's a better building. It meets the code. But is that fair? So every review requires that common sense approach. Okay. And it's... It's a bit of interpretation. It's a bit of uh, collective thinking. It's it's sometimes managerial decision making. Um, sometimes it's meeting with our colleagues across the way in other jurisdictions and and asking what do you do in this situation. There's a lot of that, and there are a lot of regional meetings that occur, and we discuss things like that. You know, so. Um, that, uh, does that answer your first question? Um, so customers will say, well, you know, you made me do this, but my neighbor didn't have to do that. But every situation and circumstance is different and unique. We hope that we're trying to apply an even balance across the way. But as Doug and I always say, we're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. And that's a tough part of the job is that if we miss things, we get fingers pointed at us because there's usually somebody getting hurt. If we go too far, we're being fingers pointed at us because it costs them too much. How do you find that balance? Um, your second question was... I don't know, I got scribbles here. Um, um, oh, if they're not health and safety changes, is it reasonable for us to expect the commercial tenant to make these upgrades? You, you kind of touched on that. Yeah. Um, by the way, in, in terms of um, uh, authority, um, building officials actually have more authority than the RCMP in terms of entering a premise, believe it or not. Oh. Yeah. RCMP require a warrant. Um, if there is truly a 
I know Doug's probably laughing back there. Yep. He is. He is. <laughs> <laughs> it's the he's the, he has a gun. He's the... <laughs> John Reed he's, along with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's the toughest guy in town. <laughs> um, so, yeah, of course, you know, we're, we always give notification 24, 48 hours. However, if there is a serious life safety issue that oh. we believe, we can enter that place. We can actually get what's called an administrative warrant uh, to, to enter a, a property and judges will hand those out. We've never done it. We don't have to do it. Fortunately, we usually uh, the issues that we're up against are never that serious. But if we had to, we could. Okay. But we have the authority to enforce bringing it up to code if that's the decision that's made. Oh, absolutely. Even yeah. if it isn't a life and a safety code. Well, the, there's two pieces there. The building bylaw states that if you are applying for a building permit that you must comply with the code and that's our job. But in terms of ongoing maintenance, we, we have no uh, obligation to, to enforce people to maintain their property. And that's like, for instance, if, if, a, if a business falls into disrepair, for example, okay. yeah, uh, landlords and owners are responsible 100% for the condition of their property, and that's the you know the section first section in the code is that an owner is ultimately responsible. Now, an, a responsible owner will come to the city, pull a permit, and do the repair work. But we don't walk around and say, you know, that needs painting, that needs fixing. <laughs> we would never. Yeah. yeah gonna, well, this gonna, is very. This is very useful. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to Councillor Hasbin sit next. And my last question. Hey Jim. Good. I, I like the direction you're going. I, a bunch of questions I've asked. The other council on Councillor Morrison's question: Do we have information packages? Let's say for the uh, Clinton Center Mall, that the administration there has an information package on TIs, how the application. So when they have tenants coming in. They provide your new TEIs. Here's the information package, either a printed version or electronic version. And to other buildings around here that have tenants within the building management companies, do we send any information like that package of information to them, either printed version or electronic version? Do we do that, or should we do that? Uh, through the chair, yeah, uh, great question. Again, um, we have lots of printed material. We have brochures just on tenant improvements. We've got the one-stop shopping brochure. We've got brochures on setting up a daycare. Uh, you know, setting up just about any type of business. It's on the web. Um, we're actually rebuilding our web, and it's going to be far more uh, um, robust in terms of uh, um, uh, having links that send uh, people who work on TIs to the right standards and 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 and, and appropriate uh, um, uh, other websites out there. Links, you know, such as if you're building a restaurant, you need to have kitchen requirements. That's a whole different set of regulations for kitchen equipment. So. Um, uh, we, we do that. Now, we're working with David Monroe and his group because he's reaching out early into the process. When he talks about new businesses, David comes in and talks to Doug and I. And we give him brochures and we explain to him what do they need and David's actually distributing this material. Do we active, actively distribute it? No, we don't. We don't like do a, a shotgun approach to distribute material out there to propose um, businesses or applicants. Um, that's something we could discuss. Not sure. That could be fairly costly or time sensitive, but. Yeah, I'm just thinking yeah. when, when you look at, say, the mall, for example, and they've got a bunch of tenants here, if they know they're doing the lease and they're having a package, the person, okay, if you get, when you're doing the lease, here's the tenant improvements, this is the process, what you, so before they even come to the city, they're starting up in that program. So I think, on, I'm not saying for everything, I think well, I'm looking at your more larger places that are going to have multiple tenants within them, that that process for them to have that information. But people can still go to our website, but if those groups here are saying, okay, we're leasing a part of our lease, you add this into your, when you're attracting a new tenant, you're going to sign a lease for them, here's the information you're going to need to get yourself going, here's the basics, go to the city. I mean, that, can I, sorry, that, uh, um, Mr. McIntyre wanted to, I think, respond to that. So. I saw his hand up. Sure, thanks, Mr. Chair. I just no, picking up on the comments, um, and I, I can recall from years. 
passed, there was some protocol that had been worked up between the city and the Clemson and Mall. Because they, you're right, there's a lot of a lot of uh, um, business startups there. Uh, so we'll look at that. But um, also the suggestions I heard a couple times around the table about uh, packaging this material, making it accessible, getting it out there. We'll, we'll do that, and I, I think that's that's good outreach, uh, particularly with the mall and some of the other uh, major uh, landlords. Um, and uh, we'll make them aware of the systems we have in place and, and, and to uh, to work with us. Even at our industrial land, people that do the stuff, that type of those group of people that deal people here. Here's the similar. The other thing is we looked at your presentation earlier about the plan checking and all that. Is it possible to use that in the, for people on, uh, not some of the similar ones, but on your more complex ones where you've got plumbing, structural, different things, that their TI goes into an electronic system that can be reviewed and processed quicker. Is that something that would be looked at also within the TIs in the future? Is that possible? Um, through the the the, 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 the plan? Yeah. TIs are going through the plan. It is going to go Oh, absolutely. No, every every permit application will be going through e plan. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hudson. And I had Dr. Stewart next. Okay, just to clarify a couple of things you, you commented on. Dennis's um, comment related to uh, letting uh, major landlords uh, know about this. I suggest as well some of the, there's a half dozen significant leasing agents that lease almost everything in Coquitlam. They're, they're, Good they're, idea. They're, they're helpful. Um, I wonder if you could also clarify there, in case anyone got uh, uh, an inaccurate impression related to your ability to enter a uh, private home as distinct from commercial, institutional, or common property of uh, residential. Thank you for the clarification. Good. Okay, see Sorry, that was a question. Oh, quite, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, there is no distinction. It says any. I can't remember the wording, but it's, it's any occupation, any habitable space or place used for work. So any, any, um, basically any building where people are using that structure for work or residential use can be entered in. To where, where you know or where you suspect there's an issue. Uh, yeah. That's not a routine inspection. No, no. Yeah. yeah. And the retroactive application of code. Um, obviously, uh, we can't go in and order sprinklers in a building built in that Correct. Yeah, okay. Code isn't retroactive. It, the code that applies is the code that applied when it was built. That's, yeah. That is correct. And uh, you can't upgrade, you can't order upgrades beyond, or, um, unless the renovation is making matters worse or expanding floor area of a mezzanine or correct. something like that. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bontemple, Mr. McIntyre, for the presentation. Move adjournment. Second moved by Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Asmussen. Move receipt of the report prior to moving. So moved. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so moved by uh, O'Neill, second by uh, Councillor Marston. All in favor? Okay, it's carried. Okay, and then adjournment was moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried as well. Thank you. Five minutes.